I get it. I know exactly where you are coming from. Why would anyone want to spend $1,599 on Apple's new studio display? It doesn't support HDR. It doesn't have DisplayPort doesn't have HDMI 2.1. Heck, it's still a 60 hertz panel. And even more importantly, it looks like last year's 24 inch iMac, that's $300 cheaper. You're just missing the computer. Now, if this sounds like you or someone that you know, you are in the right place because in today's video, I'm gonna tell you exactly why, not only the studio display is worth $1,599, but why it is probably the best display for most people that are out there today. My name is Mike, welcome back to the channel. I'm glad that you're back with me today. We are talking about Apple studio display and we're gonna talk about why it is worth $1,599. Apple closed out peak performance event with a bang, announcing many new products that really are designed to make your jaw hit the floor. Now, you might think that the studio display is overpriced, you might think that it has outdated tech, and you might think that the display is not necessarily worth the money. Well, I have 10 reasons why it is none of those things and why it is worth $1,599. Now, we are gonna go through the ins and outs of the studio display and some of the technologies that it uses, I'm gonna abstract some detail, so if there is something that you need more clarification on, feel free to comment down below. I'm very active in the comments and I can clarify anything that you need. Now let's start with number 10. Now the studio display utilizes a single Thunderbolt 3 cable, so you're living that single cable lifestyle. And this amazing display allows seamless integration to the desired workflow without any hassle whatsoever. Thunderbolt 3 is capable of transferring data at 40 gigabits per second, allowing the host computer to push the studio display's native 5K resolution effortlessly. Using the studio display at this resolution requires 28 gigabits of data out of the 40. So on the 2021 MacBook Pro with M1 Max like I have here, I could push three 5K displays, one for each of the Thunderbolt 3 ports, and by extension, the lack of HDMI or display port means that it can be used with any Mac that supports Thunderbolt 3, including Intel Macs, which is I think is gonna be great for a lot of people out there that still have an upgraded to Apple Silicon. In addition to, you can use it with the new 2022 iPad Air 5 and any iPad Pro from 2018 on, including the 11 inch and the 12.9 inch, doesn't matter if they have M1 or not. So that's a great benefit, because again, it gives you maximum compatibility with older Macs and newer Macs alike. I've been an owner of an Apple Cinema Display since 2008, and I still own it to this day. Now, Apple's improving upon many of the, as I say, shortcomings of that Cinema Display in the most recent studio display. This includes a narrow uniform bezel that wraps around the entirety of the 27 inch IPS LCD display, giving it a screen to body ratio of just over 89%. There's plenty of IO on the back, incorporating a 12 megapixel camera on the front, but we'll get more on that in just a few minutes. Now, two of these displays should look really nice side by side, and I'm getting mine on Friday. So if you wanna see that unboxing or even a further comparison with the LG 5K and a few other 4K monitors that I have, make sure you are subscribed to the channel, turn on notifications, and if you like this type of content, Consider hitting like so YouTube knows to send this type of content out to other people who have similar interests as you and I. Now, without a doubt, Apple's classic design definitely plays a role here in how good the display looks. I mean, again, I think the display looks really good. When you compare other displays, like I have this LG 5K ultrafine display, which it is kind of ugly. It's got chunky bezels. The bezels are not uniform. It's actually bigger on the top, but it is a display that fits my needs as a content creator, someone who works with video and photography very often who requires kind of those extra high fidelity features, which I'm gonna get into next. Now, without a doubt, the studio display is an expensive, expensive, expensive purchase when it starts at $1,599. And unlike its more expensive brother, it does come with a stand in the box. And that price quickly goes up to $1,899 if you wanna add the nano reflective coating that's gonna cut down on glare, or it goes up by $400 to $2,299 if you want the stand that's gonna have be tilt and height adjustable. Well, now you can get a VESA option. It is configurable that way. It does not cost more than the $1,599 but it's not gonna be interchangeable. It comes from the factory that way and they're not selling these parts on the Apple store today. Maybe they will do in a few months like they did with the Pro Display XDR and the Mac Pro, but no one knows. Now, all things considered, the studio display objectively offers good value for the money when you compare it against other displays that are in the same category that offer similar functionality. Now, I'm not gonna be compared against a $200 monitor that you can buy from Best Buy or from Target. Obviously a $300 monitor and a $16 monitor don't operate and perform the same ways. They're not engineered to the same design specifications. They don't solve the same use cases other than just being a display. So it's not fair to compare those two. But there are really three things that you wanna keep in mind that I find important, which I think you should too, if you are consider buying a monitor of this caliber. It's gonna be one, pixels per inch, two, it's gonna be color depth, and three, it's gonna be display brightness. When working in content creation field, like photography, videography, app development, music creation, you wanna make sure that you have a high pixel density because this is gonna allow you to fit all of your content on the display, but also you could scale the UI and allow for more or less content, I mean, depending on what your needs are. Now, when I edit a video, I use this LG 5K display 
and I don't run the display at the max resolution. I like to run it just maybe a degree or two down below that so I can fit more content on the screen and still balance kind of my aging eyes with the needs of trying to finish the edit as quick as possible. The studio display offers that same number of pixels per inch, which it is super bright, very crispy, and again, your content should look great, really no matter what the content you're using it on. Second is gonna be color depth, or as it's sometimes referred to as bit depth. Now for each color that you wanna represent, you need to have a bit, and for each bit, that bit could be on or off. So if you had a single color display, monochromatic, you would have one bit, and that bit would be either on or off. That's a two-bit display. And as you add more bits, you're able to represent more colors. Now, commonly among monitors, you see some things that are 8-bit displays. You see 8-bit displays with frame rate control, and you see 10-bit displays. So you want to make sure that your display and the computer both support the maximum number of colors that you're looking for. Otherwise, it's going to default to the lowest common denominator that they both support. Now, some displays support 10-bit color, but they don't really support it, I would say, equally. That's what you call 8-bit plus frame rate control. So 8-bit plus frame rate control is a method that display manufacturers use to support 10-bit color, use adjacent colors to the original color, and then flash between those two colors back and forth to fool our eyes to thinking that we're actually seeing it. Now, how that commonly manifests itself that you'll see banding around an image when that monitor does not support the full 10-bit color versus 8-bit with frame rate control. Now, display manufacturers do this as a way of saving on their component budget and their thermal budget in order to keep monitors cool and the cost of the monitor down low. But if you're looking for something with high color fidelity, you wanna make sure that the monitor that you're purchasing does support 10-bit color. Now, number three is gonna be display brightness. Now, most computer screens that you see today have a brightness rating of somewhere between like 375 and maybe 450 nits, which is the unit of measurement that they do to measure brightness on a display. Now the Apple MacBook Pro 2021 has a standard brightness of 600 nits and it's capable of doing HDR workflows which goes up to 1600 nits. The iPad Pro 600 nits as well for standard workflows and it'll do I think 12 or 1600 nits as well for HDR workflows. Uh, maybe even the, the iPad Air 5 has 500 nits of brightness. Now depending on the type of display you choose will depend on the type of brightness level that you are going to get. So these displays are engineered and calibrated to hit a peak level. Now, what we know about the Apple Studio display today, it supports 600 nits of brightness, which is a full 100 nits you know, more bright. That means this display should be more than adequate for most people's use cases. Now, some displays offer HDR, but what they're able to do is they're able to ramp up the brightness for short periods of time, unlike the Pro Display XDR, where it hits 1600 nits of sustainable brightness, which is why it costs so much money. Number seven, nano texture. Now, depending on the environment that you are physically located in, you might want a display that has some type of coating on it to scatter light. And that's exactly what is available on the studio display. The nano texture coating allows the display to be used in bright lighting conditions or direct lighting conditions and have that light not impact the brightness or the fidelity of the display, which is something that depending on, again, what you do in the environment that you're in, it might be something that you would look into for the three or $400 that it is. Now for me, where I'm at here, I can control the lightning. I have some shades over here. I have lights behind me, so I can very much control the light and the lighting conditions that I'm in, which is why I didn't purchase that. Number six is reference modes. Now simply stated, the studio display allows users to turn on reference modes in order to calibrate the display to certain production environments. So when you're turning on a reference mode, you might turn set white point, you might set color balance, gamma, and brightness. And those allow you to edit or view your content as it is intended or what is the specification for that type of content. And again, if you work in a field that requires a high level of color fidelity, this is exactly what you're looking for because the studio display allows you to enter that mode and calibrate the display to that reference mode making sure that your content is always pixel perfect. Number five, power delivered. One of the benefits of living that single cable lifestyle, like we talked about number 10 with Thunderbolt 3, is that cable itself can charge your Mac. Now, depending on what Mac you have, there are certain power requirements for that, but USB-C PD, or power delivery, makes sure that is possible because the studio display is capable of delivering 96 watts of power. Now, what that means is that you can fast charge almost any Mac in the lineup, including your 14-inch MacBook Pro, and it's enough power to sustain the 16-inch MacBook Pro that I have here from 2021. And I think it's one of the best features that you have there because then you don't have to worry about charging your Mac separately. You can have that single cable all the way through living your best life. Number three is gonna be just how the studio display sounds. And it should sound very, very good if you ask me because it has a six speaker system in it, four force canceling subwoofers and two tweeters, giving this, I think, on par, if not maybe even a little bit better than the iMac from 2021 where that had a great set of speakers. Now, also included in that is the ability to use Hey Siri 
whether or not you use it or not, but it does have the ability to use Hey Siri. So if you have an older Mac or a Mac that doesn't support Hey Siri, you should be able to go ahead and use this. So you should have all around good sound when you're using this studio display because it does give you access to listening to Dolby Atmos and it does support spatial audio as well. I don't know about you, but every device I've heard spatial audio on, it's compelling where I wanna to listen to it now all the time. But while you're working in a room, you should be able to fill that room up with audio that takes up the entire room and gives you, you know, presence in it. Again, those are all good things. Number two is gonna be the fact that the studio display has a dedicated 12 megapixel camera, which is the ultra wide camera from the newer iPhones that has 122 degree field of view. This enables the camera on the studio display to utilize center stage, which is this auto framing technology that Apple has on all their devices, now including the iPad Pro, the iPad Air, the iPad Mini, not yet made to the basic iPad and hasn't made it to the iPhone, but those devices at this point, maybe it's not justified. This feature is not only nice for those of us who are using their Mac to take calls in an office or maybe in the home office, like you might find here, but I think it's actually gonna be really key in Apple's business strategy, because you might have this display on a conference room display and as people enter the room, leave the room, or as people are talking with FaceTime now, you see that it'll auto enlarge someone who is talking. I think this might be part of Apple's underlying strategy to get their feet into more businesses. Now, this is one of the use cases I plan to test with that studio display and see how it works. So if you wanna see that again, make sure that you are subscribed. But because it is designed for conferences and I think conferences are maybe not an afterthought, you have this high degree of audio visual fidelity kind of combined when taking conference calls. And that really leads into number one, really the number one reason why I think that this studio display is well worth it. Again, not, not because of the, the color fidelity, the pixel fidelity over any other display or why the studio display is even worth it is because of the high degree of integration that is offered. It runs the A13, which is gonna power the speakers, power the mics, power the 12 megapixel webcam with center stage. It's gonna control both ends of the technology and it's gonna allow you the most seamless experience when using your Mac which is really one of the reasons I think most people get a Mac because you can use your iPhone, you can use a Mac, you can use an iPad, and all of the things, for the most part, work seamlessly together. And this is just another link in that chain to increase the cohesiveness of the experience. Now, just to be clear, I know that there are downsides to the studio display. I know that objectively speaking, it is not a perfect fit for everyone, and that's not what I'm suggesting. Now, if you were a part of the PC Master Race, there's very little reason for you to purchase this machine. I mean, really, you might not even have Thunderbolt on your machine, but more importantly, even if you do have Thunderbolt and you connect this in, you are not gonna get the advanced features that this display is designed for and the high degree of integration that you get with having it on a Mac. Second is the glaring omission that this display has endless connectivity options as long as it's Thunderbolt 3. And what that means is that it doesn't support sending video over HDMI, it doesn't support sending video over DisplayPort because those ports or those interfaces are not natively integrated on the machine. But to that end, neither one of those cables are capable of delivering power, whether you're using the newest version of the spec or not. So using them would actually be a step backwards in terms of functionality, because I would not be able to use a single cable. Again, single cable lifestyle all the way. And lastly, if you're anything more than, say, a casual gamer, you don't want this display because it doesn't offer you the high frame rate that I think is probably the requirement that you would have in terms of gaming because you'd probably rather have high frame rate than high color fidelity or high color accuracy. That's gonna be the expectation there. So you wouldn't wanna get this display. And that is exactly why you know, that display is not gonna be perfect for those types of individuals who, who have those use cases. But I wanna know what you think. Let me know what questions you have down in the comments below. My name is Mike. This is Tech 24 7 TV. I'll talk to you in the next one.